And so nobody wonders, I will put this on YouTube. So I prepared the camera. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess so. All right, cool. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Nicholas. I'm an entrepreneur from Germany. And I'm, today I'm going to introduce to you big data for the ones that don't know it yet. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I found secrets in global trade. So I'm very excited to be here in Guangzhou because since I was a kid, I was really um, interested in productions and factories. And so Guangzhou is the place to be. It's amazing. Um, about big data, first of all. Data is everywhere. So when you look around you, everything can be recorded, can be quantified, can be put into a chart. And basically, big data just means really big charts. And um, when you make those charts big enough, actually it's then when a magic can happen. So in short, when you have a big chart, a lot of information, you can uh, find correlations between two different uh, variables. And with a correlation, you can find a trend. With a trend, you can make a prediction. So in plain English, you can predict the future. Uh, but to put it into, like, to make it easier, I have a practical case, or two practical stories, how it's used. So first of all, it was in a hospital in um, Ontario, there were, or in Toronto. It was a data scientist. She walked into the nursery for the youngborns, and she saw the heart rate monitors, and she asked the doctor, why do you have those? And he says, well, if any kid gets really sick or hurt, then we know by the heart rate monitor that this is happening, and we can intervene. We can uh, give the medication that's necessary. So the scientists asked, well, what are you doing with all this data? Like, um, do you use it? And they said, well, we store it, but we don't use it. We just like, see it to know what's happening right now. And she said, well, as a data scientist um, and big data, maybe she can find something. So she got access to the data as well as to the health records of the kids and babies. And she looked for correlations. And so she found a correlation in changes of the heartbeat to infections. And actually, she even found a correlation from changes of the heartbeat that um, showed that later, at a later stage, like 24 hours later, some infections would happen. And uh, she went to the doctor, told him about the information, about what she found. And with it, all the data that gathered, it was 100, um, it was no, 1 million babies they had for the data. And uh, with all this data, it was pretty clear that these changes of the heartbeat meant that some kind of infection is coming. And also, they could see a little bit which kind of infection is coming. So this gave the doctor the power to intervene before the baby would have to suffer any of uh, those cases. So like a century ago, it would have been magic. The doctor would say, well, tomorrow, this kid would have this infection. So let's better give him the medication now. Now it's possible. And a second case, a more funny case with big data. So Target, a big store in the US, is collecting data. So when you go to buy something, they save your credit card number. And they save next to it what you have bought and the uh, date. So over a bigger time span, they can see the changes of what you're buying. And one day, the boss of Target walked to one of his data scientists and said, hey, the best clients we have are young families. They are really loyal. They stay with us and they buy a lot. Is there any way we can find out which client will, be having, like, will get a kid soon, which women will be pregnant soon, or is already pregnant probably, so we can advertise to these families or to these women? And the data scientist said, well, I'm going to have a look into it. So he got all this data, went to his office, and it took months. But he achieved to find correlations between pregnancy and buying behavior. So for example, in the early stages of a pregnancy, women start buying um, food with a lot of zinc, a lot of calcium, a lot of magnesium to really bulk up on that to be healthy during the pregnancy, really in the first weeks already. And a little later, they would buy unscented lotions because it just seems healthier for the kid. Um, the magnesium, the calcium, it seemed yes, but for the uh, lotions, I'm not sure. However, um, like there was a funny case a little later in Minneapolis, because a father came walking angrily into the local Target store and said, you're sending my uh, little daughter advertisements 
for baby equipment, like um, diapers and stuff. Like, she's just going to high school. Why do you encourage her to get a baby? And she was really upset. And the Target store manager didn't know about the new developments in the head office and said, he's so sorry, he doesn't know. But yeah, those are really baby advertisements. She shouldn't get that. And so um, a week later, the Target store manager just followed up to call and say, again, he's so sorry, he didn't know how that happened. And the father said, no, no, actually it's me who has to apologize. Um, my daughter was in fact pregnant since recently, she just didn't tell me. So it was Target that knew about her pregnancy before the father knew. So, um, yeah, her purchases, the changes of her purchases over time, so they could predict. Um, so you see there's a lot of power in big data and, and to, see, to make these um, things happen you need a lot of data. So much data that a uh, human mind can't work with it. It's um, data sets that have like between, it starts at like 1 million, goes to hundreds and hundreds of billions to trillions of data points which you need a really strong computer to go through but then it's really like magic. Um, so as I told you in the uh, beginning I came to Guangzhou because I love factories, and so I, did a lot of, so I did a lot of trading. And during my bachelor program, I um, had to do a practical training for half a year. So I decided, hey, I want to go to China. China. I want to learn how to find the best factories. So I went to Shenzhen. I went to a skateboard trading company, and they taught me how sourcing works, how factory sourcing works. So they showed me their different data sources, and I just have to work through them, and then I find the best factory. So I took that knowledge, went back to Germany, and I used it to help find uh, factories for many German companies. And after a while I realized, hey, my work is really repetitive. But if it's repetitive, it can be automated. So I thought, okay, I'll try to automate parts of my work. And I looked for different data sources, all were kind of boring, and there was one that was kind of crazy. It was so big, and um, it was the data source of the uh, contents of containers, of shipping containers. And actually, these documents would state like the vessel name, the HS code, the date that left the port, kind of boring. But it would also state who shipped out the data, who received the data, um, who shipped out the products, who received the products, and what was inside the container. So that was much more interesting. So I gathered all the data I could get, and I opened the files, and it looked like this, terrible. So actually, if you scroll down, you realize the cursor doesn't even move because this file was two gigabyte big. And like, if you had gigabytes of like, just words, it's just endless amounts of words. And that was just one file of the 20 files I got. So I thought, OK, have, I just take a little bit of it, put it into an Excel chart so I can have a look at it, and then I deleted lots of um, information that wasn't very helpful. And so it looked like this. It was already like, much easier to understand. So it showed me like, the shipper, showed me the consignee, and the product description as well as the date. So I said, hmm, now if I can look for a brand, then it would show me their factory. And it would also show me which product they got from their factory. So that would be really helpful for my clients. However, um, also at that point I was thinking like, it's just one point of time. Like who knows if that factory was good? They like delivered once, but maybe the client was unhappy. So for example, one client wanted me to look for the manufacturers of Under Armour. I said, yeah, but if I look here, then I would have the manufacturer, but who knows if they're good. Maybe Under Armour was extremely unhappy. So um, I talked to some friends and looked through the internet how to work with big data. And I found that if I put it on a very strong server, then um, actually I could go th scroll, crawl through all of these data sets. So I wrote down the five most important commands, which were uh, find, like if I type in a keyword, find the uh, supplier, find the buyer, and uh, li like put them, show them together, and show how often they work together. And so I put, so it happened to look like this. Um, so like if I put in Under Armour, it would show me the factories, right? like when you scroll up or down, it shows you more factories. It would uh, show you what they bought, and to which Under Armour departments it would go, and it would show you the other clients of the factories. And so I looked at this and I thought, like with the numbers behind, the Under Armour shows you 1,394 productions. This manufacturer must be really reliable. And this manufacturer must have a really good price quality ratio because Under Armour, they have a big sourcing department. And if they're not perfectly uh, satisfied, they will go somewhere else. And 
all of their clients ordered many times. So all of the clients have been satisfied because normally if you're not satisfied, you go away after the first production. So I played a little bit more around with it and I found, oh, this is weird. This is actually better than what I was sourcing before myself. So I tried to build a tool that would support me, but I outworked myself like this is better than me. So actually, like when I typed in a keyword, the result that came out was better than what I could do as a sourcing manager. And I looked around at the other sourcing managers, and they couldn't measure things like reliability either. Like they would ask the manufacturer, like, "Are you reliable? Do you like make good price for good price?" And they said, "Of course we do." And do your customers stay over a long time? Yes, of course. But nobody like had the data, like the way to work with the data. So this was pretty exciting for me. Mm. And I thought, OK, so who does this really help? Like big companies, multinationals I've been working with, they don't really need it. They have their 20, 30 sourcing managers or more, and they do nothing else and look for the best factory every day, the whole day, and their results are good. So they don't really need to change. But it's like Kickstarter projects, or Amazon shops, or Shopify shops, or anyone who wants to start a little brand. Like when they want to find a factory, they mostly end up finding some small trader who has great photos and going with them. And like while Nike makes their shoes for five US dollar, they would probably make their shoe for 25 US dollar. And that makes it, and at a worse quality, this makes it extremely hard to uh, like build your own product. Most product companies need like five or six years to get to that point where they can actually compete. And when I, did the, when I looked around, I also found, um, all right, that's a little later actually. So first of all, I put it on the internet. And so I started a search for us today. So I looked for Guangzhou to see who is the biggest exporter here. And actually, this company that I didn't, have never heard of jumped up, Jabel Circuits. And they do electronic vacuum cleaners for iRobot. So yeah, Guangzhou is a really big exporter for electronic vacuum cleaners. And number two is LG Display. So it's a funny tool to just play around. You can type in cities, you can type in products, factories. Like if a factory is telling you they work for Nike, you can just type in the factory name now. You can see if it's true. And it's really funny to go around the Canton Fair and just check what they say, if it's true or not. Um, so I, after placing this on the internet, I um, put it into the Hong Kong UST MBA alumni group and just uh, wanted all my classmates to try it. And one of my classmates, she was working, she worked for Walmart. So she forwarded it to the Walmart sourcing department because it showed all of Walmart suppliers and what the products they supply to Walmart. That's actually kind of secret information of Walmart. They don't want to display that information. So a little later, she gave me a message saying, hey, talk to the sourcing department. And they're really wondering how you got their sensitive information. And I was just saying, well, maybe we can work together and I can help you close those leaks. And um, she said, no, no, don't worry about it. We know how you got the data. I said, seriously? How did I get it? And they said, well, you went to every factory and you asked them if they work for Walmart. I was like, whoa, I have like 10 million factories in my data sets. How did I do that? Um, and actually, the funniest correlation I found, or like weirdest point was that, uh, like any sourcing manager, when I would wanted to find the best factory, it's an industry standard to ask, send me your catalog, give me the link to your website, and give me your price list. And what I found with the results is crazy. Um, I called the best factories, number two, one and two and three, and asked them, can I have your catalog? We don't have a catalog. Can I see your website? We don't have a website. Always the best factories, or almost always, they had no website, no catalog. Sometimes they had price lists, but basically they say they normally don't do that because the customers tell them what to produce. So how can they know that price in advance? Um, so actually what we used to decide on uh, who are the best factories was actually a sign of being not the best factory. And the correlation was the other way around. So if someone had a really nice catalog with amazing product pictures, I, found, I didn't find them in the top list at all. I found them somewhere very far in the back. So I did a little research, looked around, and asked like, the best factories how they can explain it. They said, well, we only focus on uh, productions. We really don't want to have anyone contact us, us that is not totally sincere about a production. And so the big uh, companies, they will find out eventually that we, that we exist. But for, the, um, but for some people who just want to gather information, uh, that, uh, or just want to talk, they take up too much of our time because we want to focus on productions only. And for when I went to visit companies that had like really nice catalogs, really nice photos, the boss was actually spending half of his time working in marketing and uh, thinking about how to gather more clients. And while the top one factories that focus on productions said they really have to 
choose a client they have to hide to not get too many requests and just focus on the real productions. It was the other way around for the people who had catalogs. So yeah, that is very strange because the whole sourcing industry works with catalogs and this data uh, turned kind of around. Um, it's basic, it's a basic factory, but not the best one. They try to get up still, so they try to put it in marketing instead of becoming the best. Um, so I'm telling you, like, there's many ways that you can use the tool yourself. It's kind of fun to use. Uh, I'm still working, like this is the way it should look like in the near future. So it will show you the changes of how much uh, factories or companies buy and sell. And so I want to leave you four use cases, how you can use the data, which is kind of fun. Um, so first of all, if you're trading stock and you see that a certain company is buying less and less and their containers get smaller and smaller, and you see that the next container that should arrive uh, for them or they should bring to the market is really small, then um, companies um, pre predict how much they will sell and that's the amount they will buy. So you have like the advantage of foreseeing how much they will sell. That can have an impact on the stock market, but hasn't tested, been tested yet. Well, you know that they sell less, so actually they should go down. If they purchase more, they expect to sell more. So you can probably expect that they go up, but there's a lot of variables that change the stock market, so it's very hard. It's just one more point of data. Mm. Another use case, um, which is kind of funny, like if you want to go to a job interview for a product company, let's say, uh, for example, Kraft Heinz, like the ketchup or something, um, you can go there and tell them, yeah, I would like to apply for your supply chain, um, and I know you're working with this, 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 and this factory. Your factories are located in those countries. And they'd be like, that's secret information. How do you know that? He says, well, I'm, you can say, well, you do sourcing. And they will be very surprised. But then if you tell them, well, your competitors, they manufacture in these countries at these factories, and they basically just all move to that new country. Why haven't you moved yet? Then the boss will be totally shocked and will be hired probably right on the spot. Because most people don't yet know this data exists. Only very few do. And um, my favorite use case, of course, is if you build your own brand. So if you build your own brand and you want to start with a like, jump of a head, then you can go directly, find the best factory. And if you get into the factory, you really have a head start. Most companies like five or six years to work their way up to that point. And so let's take the example with Nike again, who makes who make the shoes for five US dollar. You would probably have to pay eight or nine US dollar at the same factory. But compared to the 35 or 25 US dollar you would have to pay at any other way, it's still a really low price. And the quality is the same as Nike. So it really gives you a head start. It puts you into the position of competing with the best brands right from the beginning. And um, a last use case that is uh, kind of fun. You can actually see which factories only had one order from every client. And so you know the clients. And you know which one is the best factory. So you can call the best factory, get their prices, get uh, some product photos. And then call the clients of the bad factory and just tell them, if you, if you want to start trading, hey, I got this product, let me send it to you. And this is my price. You can just add a little margin. And still, you'll be better, better than the factory they've been using before. And so this is your, like, your jump into trading that is possible right now with this data. So um, time has run out, sadly. It's, um, so here's the way to reach me if you have any questions. My email address is nicholas at listthe.com. The domain that I've been talking about the whole time is listthe.com. And um, I love Coke, so if you want to have a Coke with me sometime, I, <laughs> I'm here in Guangzhou. I'm often in Ulm, Germany, or I love the valley. So uh, yeah, just hit me up. Thank you.